Hello everyone, it's Space Mike for tomorrow, and we have some breaking news. This week, <laughs> President-elect Donald Trump has nominated Jared Isaacman to be the next NASA administrator, which is crazy that we've gotten a nomination for that so early before even Inauguration Day. So far, this seems to be really well received by the space community, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little excited about it myself. Jared Isaacman may not have a ton of government experience, but he does at least have a little bit. I mean, having to adhere to regulations with his uh, financial transaction company, Shift4, uh, Drakken International, his kind of private air force that <laughs> would actually train members of the military, military aviators in the Air Force and the Navy, and the Marine Corps and doing actual war games with them, they had to go through the process of securing the government contract for that. He has since sold that company. I think he sold it a couple of years ago to the BlackRock group, unfortunately, but he's got a little bit of familiarity. Even with his idea of going and doing the Hubble servicing mission, he was able to get an unfunded Space Act agreement with NASA in order to study that idea for real. NASA, in the end, determined that they didn't want to pursue that idea at the time, but since then, a couple of the key pieces have started to materialize. It's not fully there yet to be able to service Hubble with the Dragon spacecraft, but some of the things that were the biggest concerns aren't as much of a concern anymore, thanks to his Polaris program and the Polaris Dawn mission doing that initial EVA test with the SpaceX EVA suits. And here's the thing that I like the most about Mr. Isaacman is that he is a true believer. He sees the direction that the space industry is going. He's got great connections with uh, SpaceX and others in the industry. And I think that he will genuinely try to do the right thing, genuinely will try to move things forward and not have a particular bias to rockets and meat bags like I would and wants real science to actually occur and wants cool things to, to happen at NASA. So this could be a really, really good choice. However, there's still a big if, a couple of big ifs, actually. The biggest one is that the Senate would still have to confirm that nomination. Congress would still have to confirm him as the next NASA administrator, which they may or may not do. That's kind of up in the air at this point. The other big question is whether or not Jared Isaacman is going to have to change a few things about his personal situation in order to accept that role so that he doesn't have any conflicts of interest with the Polaris program and supposed to be the mission commander of the next two Polaris missions. I don't think that a current NASA administrator, if he is confirmed in that role, would be able to take the time off to do the astronaut training and actually fly the mission. So what happens now with Polaris? There is a chance that it might just be on hold and they resume those missions after his term of NASA administrator, which will probably only be the next four years, again, if he's confirmed. There's also another chance that he might hand off those missions to somebody else that they already have in mind to be the next mission commander of the next Polaris mission. But... I mean, if you're the guy paying for this millions of dollars out of your own pocket, I, I would want to fly the mission too. So probably be okay to put it on hold, but we'll see. Now, the very next day, the current NASA administrator, Bill Nelson, held a press conference to give an Artemis mission update and give us all a few answers to the questions that we've been having about the Orion heat shield and other issues that the Artemis program has been having. So first, let's just hear from the man himself and what they have decided to do with the Artemis program. We've conducted expansive testing. We were able to recreate the problem here on Earth, and now we know the root cause. And this has allowed us to devise a path forward, which we are going to share with you today. Now, just this morning, we have concluded the executive council, and based on the data, we have decided, NASA unanimously, in our decision makers, to move forward with the current Artemis II Orion capsule and heat shield with a modified entry trajectory. 
And so we are planning for Artemis II to launch in April of 26. Wait, what? Another delay just to change the flight profile a little bit? Well, it's a little bit more than that, but... It's not launching in 2025 anymore, guys. It's launching in 2026. Maybe. And we're going to do all in our power with our commercial partners to launch earlier. Yeah, I should freaking hope so. Assuming the SpaceX lander is ready, we plan to launch Artemis 3 in mid-2027. Okay, so Artemis 3 in 2027. That will be well ahead of the Chinese government's announced intention that they are, have already publicly stated is 2030. I mean, I guess that's good, but let's get to the meat of this update. Uh, let's talk about the Orion heat shield. Pam Melroy, the deputy administrator of NASA, has some really good things to say. At its very core, NASA is a learning organization. The knowledge we gain builds uh, mission by mission, allowing us to stretch further, farther, and accomplish more. In the test campaign of Artemis, this is the exemplification of that learning. So one area that's taken us a considerable amount of time to learn from Artemis I is how the heat shield performed during the mission. Obviously a very critical aspect of the mission. She goes on to explain that Orion is doing the skip entry procedure, which is where they dip into the atmosphere a little bit to lower their apogee and then re-dip into the atmosphere to actually do re-entry. And the craziest part about this is that, ironically, they had a bit of plasma and gas that was forming on the heat shield and in the heat shield that was causing cracks to happen and pieces of it to break away that you can see quite a few pieces in this image that are no longer there. And ironically, it was caused during the lower velocity part of that skip entry. And combined with the lack of permeability on the number of the Avco blocks, uh, the heat shield that was tested at the higher heating rates performed as expected, but at the lower heating rates started to do this whole charring and breaking off of pieces, which is just nuts. So essentially what they're going to do is a direct re-entry instead of doing this skip entry to slowly lower your orbit so that you can have a safe re-enter at the target area that you want to re-enter at they're just going to do direct re-entry which i guess is a little bit scarier but if they've really done a considerable amount of tests over the past year which i'm sure they have and the astronauts seem confident that that plan is going to work so okay as we're looking ahead, we know we're going to learn a lot more on Artemis II, and we remain committed to that learning and to the rigorous process that we have always adhered to to keep our crews safe. Thank you again for your time and your continued interest in Artemis and the space program. I'll echo what Pam was saying, was sometimes in space, uh, delays are agonizing, and, and slowing down is agonizing, and it's not, like, what, not what we like to do. But from the crew perspective, the thing that we most asked our leadership for after Artemis I was root cause of the ablation of the heat shield. And we took the time. This was very, very open process. The crew certainly never felt like there was a door closed to us. We never saw any hidden data. It was all open. It was all open discussion. We had an independent review team uh, with a lot of outside experts and internal experts to look at this. So we really appreciate the willingness to take the risk to actually slow down and understand root cause, determine the path forward, corrective action for Artemis II and Artemis III, so that when Victor, Christina, Jeremy, and I launch and land after a successful Artemis II, we will look to Artemis III to carry the torch forward and to put humans back on the moon, and that is really our ultimate objective. Amit Shatria actually had some really good technical updates that explained a little bit more about what's going on with this, which 
unfortunately kind of sent me down a further rabbit hole. Before we, we saw variations in the condition of the heat shield, which in which the char the char layer that protects Orion um, broke off in ways we did not expect. We observed about 100 spots across the heat shield where that phenomenon occurred. It is normal behavior for the ablator that it's that it's built on Orion to char. The heat shield is, however, is not designed to liberate those pieces of char. Uh, instead, an, a char layer and an ablator is supposed to recede gradually, uh, so the underlying material insulates the spacecraft from the high heat flux we experience during entry. So this brought up a question that we've asked before on this show: of why are they using Avcoat instead of Pika? Avcoat is essentially the same type of heat shields that they used way back in the day during the Apollo days. It has a slightly different manufacturing process because some of the materials that it used to be made out of are quite toxic and no longer available. And NASA invented the Pika heat shield, which has been used on some of the, the Mars science landers, like the Curiosity and Perseverance rover. And they have a really cool proprietary technology that's open. SpaceX, you know, took that idea, took that technology, made a couple of improvements and calls it Pika X. And they've even made further improvements on that, which they now call Pika 3. And it's a really great heat shield. It's worked out really well for the Dragon capsule. So my question was, why isn't NASA using a better heat shield technology that they themselves invented? Well, turns out it's supply chain issues and material issues. And this one slide from a study I found in 2019 answered the question. A lot of the materials that they need in order to manufacture Pika are no longer being made. The companies that made those materials went out of business. Maybe because NASA decided to go with Avcoat back in 2005 instead of going with Pika. I don't know. That's just my theory. I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. That's not being very fair of me. My apologies. However, if you're interested in some of the technical details, I put the PDF a link to it anyway in the description so that you can check it out yourself and see if maybe together we can come up with some solutions for NASA. So we've decided that in order to enhance our learning, for Artemis II as quickly as we can, because there's nothing like flying in the flight environment to learn everything that you need to learn about how these systems will, will perform. That if, if, we, if we, we can either change the material to mitigate the issue, or we can change the environment to mitigate the issue. And for Artemis II, because of the nature of the mission, which right now the mode we're using is equatorial free return, we can safely and with high degrees of success control that entry environment. And so that, that's the plan we're going to proceed along. We are also experiencing a handful of issues um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the performance and integration of the vehicle. Um, we have, as I mentioned uh, to this community back at the beginning of the year, we have had some issues with the electrical system on the vehicle. Oh, man. Battery issues, too? Specifically when uh, the vehicle is enduring a, uh, an abort scenario, in some of those cases is... As we, in this particular case for Artemis II, the, um, the, the abort system on the spacecraft is active. It, um, so we, we need to make sure that the vehicle will have maximum capacity during, that, during those abort scenarios. We found an issue with the batteries in particular um, that they were not able to tolerate the abort environment. It's pretty severe, especially when you do an abort induced by the launch abort system. So we had to fix those batteries. And we, we've been working on that fix for a while. We were able to completely change the way that they're mounted, that they're mechanically secured. Um, and we, we have been able to um, complete that fix, qualify that fix. Uh, it was excellent work by the team at Eagle Pitcher in Joplin, Missouri that did that for us. It was, it was also sort of, it, it was difficult for them to do it because as, as was mentioned earlier, our supply chains in some of these critical areas are, are extremely fragile. And so we had, we had some difficulty finding very high reliability components and in order to complete that build. But the team there was excellent and Eagle Pitcher has a long history with us. Whew. Okay, good. That's resolved. We hope. The other thing we've been working on significantly is the life support system on, on, on the spacecraft. Oh yeah, and all the life support issues too. That definitely has to get solved, otherwise none of this is happening. Not on Orion. We're conducting a full set of integrated life support system tests on the spacecraft. We are learning every day about how that system performs. We have got to make sure that every part of that is, is uh, in the right configuration before we commit the crew to, to, to launch. Uh, we, you recall at the early part of the year, we discovered an issue with the control system 
of the valves in that, in that, in the, in particular, the carbon dioxide removal system. That that anomaly has been resolved. We've also witnessed a couple, a few issues with the uh, uh, deformation of the seat material on those valves, which has caused overboard leakage. That has also been resolved. We've also been doing performance testing of the sorbent in that in that system to make sure it's it's going to be to have the capacity uh, in in all the cases that we care about, including multiple failure cases. So we're continuing to characterize and learn and test that life support system, but it is taking us a, a longer than we thought. And so we need to we need to get that done. And uh, we, we're making excellent progress there to the point at which now we're ready, as, as we said, to commit to, 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 to commit to stacking. All right. So the, all of this definitely needs to be taken with a grain of salt. And some would say this is a little bit of a, a nothing burger, but it's not necessarily. This is at least an update and is giving some sort of path forward for how they want to proceed with things. Everything is still up in the air, and the new administration could cancel all of this. It's pretty ridiculous that we're looking at over $4 billion per launch and well over $5 billion if we ever get any of the upgrades like Block 1B or Block 2, which I don't think we should. I I think that we should just cancel it, including Orion, because Orion is super freaking expensive. And yeah, they say that it's the only vehicle right now that could safely send humans, you know, to uh, cislunar space around the moon and back safely. But can it? Can it actually do it safely? Because if we really cared about safety, we would tear that thing apart Take off that crappy heat shield and replace it with something better. Contract SpaceX to build a new heat shield for it. Come on. I know we have SpaceX doing everything now, but they could probably whip out a new one in a matter of weeks. But since Lockheed Martin's the primary contractor, even if we were to go down that sort of path, it would take them two years just to study the idea of replacing the heat shield before any work actually gets done. So whatever. I will say, though, that I am still really hopeful, and I find some of the comments that they made at this uh, briefing, especially about Jared Isaacman, and the idea that it all will be get canceled and replaced with Starship, you know, whatever it takes, man, whatever it takes to us to get back there and to keep moving forward and to make progress and to not spend so much money that the pittance of the budget that NASA gets out of the entire federal budget for the entire United States government is actually put to good use and we can start doing cool things again. I mean, NASA does cool stuff all the time, but it's a lot less frequent than it used to be, at least a lot less frequent than I remember. And if they're doing a lot of cool stuff behind the scenes, they need to be a lot more public about it because I haven't heard about cool little projects in quite some time. Anyway, I would definitely like to know what you guys think about these developments. What do you think about Jared Isaacman potentially being the next NASA administrator? And what do you think about all these updates that we've gotten with Orion and the SLS and these awful delays? Will it still even fly or will the whole thing be canceled? Definitely let us know in the comments. Definitely join us this Sunday where me and the rest of the crew are going to be talking a little bit more in depth about these interesting developments this week and what it might mean, not just for NASA, but spaceflight in general as a whole. Uh, please join us. We would love to get your guys' input during that live show as well. In the meantime, don't let this news about Orion and SLS get you down. Keep moving onwards and upwards, everybody, and don't forget, Ad Astra to the stars.